good evening and uh, namaste to everyone gathered here i re kindly request everyone to keep your mobiles in silence on behalf of the management of the medical research foundation and vision research foundation a warm welcome to everyone for the first dr s s badrinath endowment oration celebrating the visionary legend padma bhushan dr s s badrinath our guru guide and chief i now request ms bhavya ganapati to render the invocation वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए ज पीड़ पर आइए जाने रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए ज पीड़ पर आइए जाने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ये मन अभिमान ना आने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ये मन अभिमान ना आने रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर आइए जाने रे सकल लोक महुने वंदे निंदा न करे के रे वाच काच मन निश्चल राखे धन धन जननी तेणी रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर आइए जाने रे समृष्टि ने कृष्ण त्यागे पर स्त्री जेने मातरे जिह्वाथ की असत्य न बोले पर धन नव जाने हाथ रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए ज पीड़ पर आइए जाने रे मोह माया व्यापे नहीं जेने दृढ़ वैराग्य जे राम मारे राम नाम शो ताली रे लगी सकल तीरथ तेरा तन मारे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए ज पीड़ पर आइए जाने रे वर्ण लोभी ने कपट रहित छे काम क्रोध निवार वर्ण लोभी ने कपट रहित छे काम क्रोध निवार भने नर सयो तेनो दर्शन करता कुल ये को तेरा तारा रे भने नर सयो तेनो दर्शन करता कुल ये को तेरा तारा रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर आइए जाने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ये मन अभिमान ना आने रे वैष्णव 
जन तो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर आई जा Thank you so much Ms Bhavya for the soulful rendition of the iconic song. I now request our chairman Dr T S Surendran to felicitate Ms Bhavya Ganapati. Please come to the stage Ms Bhavya. She is a budding Carnatic vocalist and a disciple of Ms Vidya Kalyanaraman and she is currently studying at Kalakshetra. I request our chairman Dr T S Surendran to welcome the gathering and introduce our chief guest. Revered uh, Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi ji. Ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Good evening to all of you. I wish to extend a warm welcome to all of you. I particularly wish to welcome to this event our chief guest Sri Gopal Krishna Dev Das Gandhi. who will deliver the first dr s s badnath endowment oration we are grateful to you sir for your kind gesture the medical research foundation which runs the various shankar netralaya i hospitals in india is proud to announce the institution of this dr s s badnath endowment oration series in the in the fond memory of our visionary illustrious founder the great dr s s badnath it will be an annual event organized and hosted by shankar netralaya i must acknowledge the valuable and timely support provided by our generous donors who are present here for this endowment today marks the beginning of dr badnath endowment oration and it is indeed an honor for us to have sir to deliver this first lecture dr badnath one of the india's top most ophthalmologist and founder of shankar netralaya left us at the age of 83 on 21st november less than just 3 months ago he spent his entire professional career and practically his whole life to the task of preventing avoidable blindness with a missionary zeal amongst the poor citizens and he treated uh, both president of india and uh, local man equally as well as the india and uh, neighboring countries the hospital has treated millions of patients over the last 45 years dr badnath's ability to attract convince and rally behind him very competent and highly dedicated team of co-founding medical professionals professionals myself dr prema padmanabhan dr lingam gopal to name a few dr nirmala subramanian is also here it is indeed providential that uh, its very founding values and passion for compassion compassion intact today this iconic institution is 45 years old it's important to remember that netralaya is a charitable institution and not for for profit organization the ability to maintain its character is a charitable institution is largely due to the generosity and the relentless support of its donors i am grateful to great donors like uh, mrs malika srinivasan sugal ji is there or uh, late president mr vaidyanathan the retired chairman all of them i think have taken this institution to the greater heights dr badnath believed in uh, acquiring the latest state of the art medical equipments including the first laser in the country first uh, vitrectomy instrument etc and always uh, that he was keen to keep pace with the global standards in eye care which earned the institution world attention and recognition today we are one of the best tertiary hospitals 
with a footfall of more than 4,000 patients a day. 400 surgeries are performed every day. Almost 100 patients are treated totally free of cost. No compromise is made even today on the parameters even though Natural is run as a 100% charitable hospital. Dr. Badrinath's contribution to the world of medicine, particularly in the field of ophthalmology, are legendary and I have continued to guide the national Medicare discourse given the influence he has been able to establish among the thousands of alumni. I am happy to share that Dr. Ramesh Dwaraj is here, one of the alumni who did his fellowship in 86. For his take on and on all this, we now turn to our distinguished speaker, Sri Gopal Krishna Devdas Gandhi. Sri Gandhi is the first scholar of immense respect, is an able administrator, a celebrated diplomat, a sought after teacher. I think he is still teaching. The date was fixed on 17th because of his teaching commitment in Delhi. Author and above all, a great friend of Dr. Badrinath and Shankar Netralya. We are grateful to you, sir. He is a real Gandhi, great grandson of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the father of our great nation, and also the great grandson of Sri Rajagopalachari, the last Governor General of India. Sri Gopal Gandhi was the Governor of West Bengal during 2004 to 2009, and his great grandfather Rajagopalachari from his mother's side was the governor of West Bengal in 1947 and 48. <laughs> so I have the honor to invite and request Sir to deliver the lecture after the formalities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Girish Shivra, President and Executive Medical Director of Medical Research Foundation and Mr. G. Ramachandran, Honorary Secretary of the Medical Research Foundation to honor our Chief Guest. Thank you, sir. I request our chief guest to felicitate Ms. Preeta Lakshmanan now. Ms. Preeta Lakshmanan, I request you to please come on to the stage. If you are wondering about who Ms. Preeta Lakshmanan is, she is a professional artist specializing on hyperrealism. Her artwork with our chief guest and chief was presented to our chief guest today. She is a professional artist on hyperrealism. She is under she, she is under the expert eye care of Dr. Surendran, our chairman and his team from five years of age. She started drawing from eight years and continues. Her artworks are published in the leading dailies and magazines, the Hindu Ananda Vigdan. Her exhibits also found a place in the International Art Exhibition, Los Angeles, USA. She is also a budding photographer. Our best wishes to you, Ms. Preeta. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. 
I'm deeply grateful to Shankar Netralaya and to Dr. Surendran, Dr. Girish Rao and all of you present here for giving me this opportunity. The very generous introductory remarks of Dr. Surendran made me realize the immense potential of English adjectives to say what is a little removed from the truth. The only thing that was of any relevance and interest in the introduction was the bit about whose grandson I am. If I was not the grandson of my grandfathers, who would invite me to a function like this? <laughs> I commence with an expression of gratitude to Shankar for giving me a chance to pay my tribute to Dr. S. S. Badrinath. About 12 or 13 years ago, he had asked me to come and speak here to an international conference and he suggested the subject Gandhi's glasses. And I was asked to remind myself of that and speak on more or less the same subject which I propose to do today. But before I do that in a few minutes, I must say what I could not have said on that occasion, namely that the legacy which Dr. Badrinath has left to all of us is virtually unique and unparalleled in its quality, in its compassion, in its scientific precision, and above all in its humanity. I mentioned compassion. But it is the combination of scientific precision and compassion that made his humanity so absolutely unique. It was his extraordinary nature that made us the recipients of his treatment, the receivers of his medical and technical prowess, feel that we are doing him a favor. That he made us feel that we are doing him a favor. That was his extraordinary greatness. I do not know if you agree with me, but I sometimes understand why a patient is called a patient. A patient has to be extremely patient. <laughs> waiting in queues, waiting for the turn. But Shankar Netrave is one place where it is the doctors and the staff and everybody else who show extraordinary patience with all of us coming as we do from different circumstances of agony and of urgency, each receiving instant attention. And I just want to say how remarkably pleasing it was to hear Bhavya sing Vaishnava Janato to hear a Gujarati song sung in a Tamil voice with such beauty. And the song which says, the song which says, Samadrishti, that is the Samadrishti which Shankar Netrana gives to all. Everyone is treated with a Samadrishti and encouraged thereby to develop Samadrishti. And another line of Narsi Mehta in that song, which was refreshed by Bhavya's rendering, he said, Paro Pakara Kare, that is exactly what Dr. Badrinath taught. To do an upakara, but without any abhimana. I could say that what Subramanya Bharati was, the creation of music, was Yuvi Swaminathaya, he was in the rejuvenation of Tamil. What VOC was in the launching of Swadeshi ships, for the Arcot brothers were in education and law. Dr. Badrinath was in the medicine branch of ophthalmology. 
he was a pioneer of pioneers and I follow his instructions today when I speak on the subject that I am going to speak on. I am not speaking on Gandhi and truth, or Gandhi and non-violence, but on Gandhi and his glasses for the simple reason that he regarded himself as a very ordinary man. It was in this city on the 30th of January, coincidentally in 1947, or 46, 46, when he last came to Chennai addressing a gathering like this. There were about 100, no, 1,500 Congress workers had gathered and in, one of them asked him, what is the future of India? He said, I do not know the future of India. I am a very ordinary man. And his ordinariness was characterized by his need for glasses. Like anybody else, he needed glasses, he needed his eyes to be checked out, he needed his vision to be kept on track. By the time someone is 40 or 45, one assumes that he or she will be bespectacled. And there is a phrase in Sanskritized Tamil for that condition. It's called Shaleshwaran, <laughs> meaning fortiness. Of Gandhi's first 45 years, 21 were spent in India, 3 in England and 21 in South Africa. He was photographed minimally after a fashion in family and friends settings in the first 21 years, moderately if memorably during his three years stay as a student in England, but more frequently and pointedly during his 21 years in South Africa. But in none of the photographs of the first 45 years of his life, the years which culminated with his childish film, is there any reference to his having acquired eyeglasses? which goes to show that until well after the usual age for spectacles, this visionary was unspectacled. I asked some friends who have studied Gandhi deeply, if I was right in my impression about Gandhi being unspectacled till his mid-forties, citing the photographic evidence. Venu Madhav Govindu, in response, drew my attention to an early, if not the first, textual reference to Gandhi's spectacles. The Right Honourable V.S. Srinivasa Sastri, visiting Gandhi at the Sassoon Hospital in Pune, just before Gandhi was operated upon for appendicitis, records on 12 January 1924. This is Srinivasa Sastri. Dr. Pathak then read a draft statement to be signed by Mr. Gandhi, conveying his consent to the operation. After hearing it once, Mr. Gandhi put on his spectacles and read it himself. This is probably the first written reference to Gandhi's spectacles. Renu Gandhi also sent me links to photographs and cartoons in Tendulkar's Mahatma volumes that carried photographs from 20 and 21, 19, 20 and 21 and reproductions of two cartoons from the same years that show him bespectacled. The first of these has him wearing glasses and shirt and dhoti, which would date the glasses clearly to around 1920, but definitely before 1921 when he famously gave up wearing a shirt and dhoti of standard yardage. This caricature is from the Illustrated London News of 1920. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? I find this cartoon instructive for it shows Gandhi with an extraordinarily enlarged, ridiculously, absurdly enlarged head focused on his writing, the attention being brought almost to a sharp end point by his enormously long-handed spectacle frames ending at the lenses above his nose. Incidentally, I would like to say that the French Pants nose it refers to spectacles in connection to the nose. The Tamil Mukha Kannadi connects the spectacles to the nose, as does the Urdu Ayanak. The accoutrements in this cartoon are all equally authentic. The sitting plank, the pillows, 
the hand fan lying unused on the floor, the spittoon and the solitary wooden knob slipper, I wonder where the other of the pair went. Now let's just look at the second cartoon from the same journal in 1921. This cartoon has a, a caption, the De Valera of India, a prophet of the spinning wheel. This second cartoon takes his glasses for granted. He is bespectacled, smiling, being utterly himself through his spectacles. And not to miss the detail, his rather dazed looking secretary overworked parallel, sitting at a discreet distance in the background, is also wearing glasses. No secretary of the correspondence crazy Gandhi could have dodged myopia. For that period, 1920 and 1921, the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi have over 1,500 letters just in those two years, 1920 and 21, when this cartoon was made. 1,500 letters. If we are able to conclude that Gandhi really did not feel the need for eyeglasses before 1920, he was somewhat unusual, once again because he was doing so much reading and writing. Tridip Surad, a meticulous student of original Gandhi texts, primary materials, textual and visual, responded by giving me to a question, a photo link and saying it is not possible to ascertain the exact date of this photograph. But in 1925, he was in Rajkot on 15 February. The photos of that period do not have all glasses. He met Tagore in May that year, no glasses. But in December that year, he presided over the convocation of the Gujarat Vidya Peach with glasses on. So he has these glasses. In this frame, there are just two others wearing glasses, very prominently worn by the gentleman in front. But you may have, some of you may have wondered, who is that little lucky child sitting on Gandhi's lap? Nobody knows. My queries have drawn a blank. We do not know who that little boy is. He might have been four or five in 1925. We are probably a year away from his centenary. Gandhi was 57 years old in 1925 and by then he was certainly using glasses intermittently it would seem for reading and spinning. By 1930 when Gandhi led the famous salt march on Gujarat's coast to the village of Dandi, his face had become inseparable from the famous round shaped spectacles. Although the famous wood cut by Nandalal Bose of Gandhi on that march has him without glasses, which is an artistic license. The acclaimed Bengali painter Jamini Roy has done an oil portrait of Gandhi a little later from a photograph showing the spectacles prominently. This is an outstanding Jamini Roy, which is very different from the traditional Jamini Roy's a realistic figurative painting, the original of which hangs in the Rajbhavan in Kolkata. Nirmal Kumar Bose, the great anthropologist who became an associate of Gandhi's on the turbulent eve of India's independence, maintained a diary which is now regarded as a classic of its kind. He describes in it Gandhi's very careful procedure for his daily baths and says, Gandhiji used to bathe his spectacles also every day. And this picture by Udit Gopal shows Gandhi in 1939 in Varda cleaning his glasses. How integral his spectacles were to his person, to his daily routine can be seen from a 1945 observation of Gandhi. I took off my spectacles to wash my face, he writes. I had intended to pick them up later but forgot to do so. Why? Because something else engrossed my attention and so I became negligent. This is called 
disorganization, which is a dangerous thing. Did Gandhi ever use tinted lenses? Perhaps he did. In a famous 1940 photograph of his with a 45-year-old Vinoba Bhave taken in Sevagram, looks as if he was wearing tinted glasses. But this could be an optical illusion as the darkness of the hut might have become incumbent on the lens itself so as to make it look tinted. The lenses Vinoba himself is wearing, looking at the glare outside, do not seem to be tinted. What is the significance, if any, of this sequence? At one level, nothing, no significance. All of us wear glasses. What is unique or different or interesting about Gandhi wearing glasses? Nothing. People after a certain age need glasses and use glasses. Gandhi was an ordinary man, as he said. He was no exception. On the face of it, therefore, there is nothing more to it. But the face of it, in this case, masks a deeper eye and spectacles link. And that link may be summarized like this. Though eye glasses, spectacles are known to have existed from very early times, from when reading stones were known, like those that used to be made in Vallam, eyeglasses or spectacles came to be used really widely in the 19th century, with the American Optical Company having been formally incorporated coincidentally in the year of Gandhi's birth and the founding of the Suez Canal, namely 1869. And so for his times in India, Eyeglasses or spectacles were a relatively modern accoutrement, a wonderful new product of medical science. Gandhi is often regarded as a person who is not a man of science. He was not a man of science in the sense of some others of the generation following Charles Darwin and Albert Einstein. But he did see science and its first cousin technology as instruments that could be used either for a life that is ethical and enlightened or for one that is degenerate and dangerous. His attitude to science, including the science of medicine, kept evolving and he, if he had lived longer, we might have heard more from him on the science, environment, humankind link. And who knows, he may have said the most interesting things that have so far been said on the infinite possibilities and the equally infinite risks and hazards of artificial intelligence. And he may well have revised some of his earlier attitudes and pronouncements on the subject. Gandhi wanted to educate himself and others through assiduous experiments with truth in the use, the right use, the overuse, the misuse, the disuse and the abuse of creation's gifts and its inventions. Spectacles fitted into Gandhi's evolving sense of health care as part of intelligent and compassionate living. His interest in eye care became part of his interest in a healthy body kept healthy by assiduous attention to its tone without an automatic and a mind-closed-shut dependence on medication. In a 1931 letter to a lady called Haricha, suffering from an eye ailment, he said, Cure the eye soon. Wash it with warm salt water. And here I must say, like in everything, we must treat whatever Gandhi has said and written with our minds open and be extremely ready to differ from him as I certainly do in his following comment. Warm salt water for the eyes. I am not so sure. A little quantity of pure salt, he says, should be sprinkled on the eye. I am not at all sure. And then he says, try milk bandage on the eye at night. Milk bandage on the eye? Sorry, Bapu. 
Now the use of salt for the eyes may be inadvisable and I have no idea what a milk bandage is, nor frankly am I sure. I do not want to irrigate my eyelids with lactose, I am sure. Sorry, Bapu. But there it is, his lively engagement. Gandhi was as a father to his secretary, Mahadev Desai. And we have this letter from Gandhi about Desai's spectacles. One of the lenses in Mahadev's glasses is broken and as a result, he is very much inconvenienced. A lens of that type is not available here. The glasses were got made in June, July last year by Dr. Bhaskar. The firm has got Mahadev's number. If it does not have it, you will get it from Dr. Hiralal Patel. Probably the company will also have details of the size of the lenses and the frame. But in case it does not have them, Hiralal will help to get the glasses made. In February 1933, he wrote to Harry Ehrlich, an optometrist based in New Jersey, asking whether defective vision can be cured by means of exercise. Ehrlich replied saying, it is not possible and added that advocates of eye exercise themselves use glasses. <laughs> Harry Ehrlich was clearly a commonsensical believer in modern medicine and no new age prophet. And at the same time, Gandhi's American friend Richard Gregg wrote to Gandhi giving an idea of the benefits derived by him and his friends for their defective eyesight by means of exercises suggested by Dr. W. H. Bates and forwarded a copy of the book Keener Vision Without Glasses by Benjamin Hauser and published by Tempo Books in New York. I am not aware of how Gandhi responded to these contrary bits of advice, but we do know and Wikipedia confirms that William Bates, the American physician, practiced ophthalmology and developed what became known as the Bates method for better eyesight, a method intended to improve vision by undoing a supposedly habitual strain to see. The efficacy of the method has been and continues to be seriously questioned as is Bates's theory that the eye does not focus by changing the power of the lens but rather by elongating the eyeball through use of extra ocular oblique muscles. In 1929, Gandhi wrote, Some look upon me as a fool, a crank or a faddist. I must admit that wherever I go, I am sought out by fools, cranks and faddists. One can conclude from this that I must be having the characteristics of all these three types. Whatever Gandhi's eyes were, good, bad or indifferent, his sense of humour and the ability to laugh at himself was the best. But if Wikipedia is to be gone by and no risk-free exercise that is, the tide began to change by the 1970s as scientific researchers validated many of Hauser's views on nutrition and health and many now regard him as the founder of the natural food movement and a pioneer who was ahead of his time. Gandhi likewise and rather more famously than Hauser, is also regarded now as a pathfinder in that the wider related fields such as environmental conservation and ecological intelligence. Gandhi's involvement with the ophthalmic status of those around him was part of his interest in their general well-being. He saw to it that his wife Kasturba had her eyes tested regularly and given a pair of spectacles as was required by her. On 4 January 1945, he wrote to his granddaughter Sumitra, who had an eye-related problem and was studying for exams. Sumi, first about your eyes. You should not be in a hurry to pass the exam. You may do as much work as you can while taking care of your health and of your eyes. His priorities were clear. Better to miss out on a year of study, but not at the expense of your vision. The bespectacled Gandhi, or rather the bifocal Gandhi, has appeared on many stamps worldwide, especially around the time of his birth centenary. 
the government of newly independent India wanted to issue a stamp with his visage. This became possibly this became possible only a year later, by which time Gandhi was gone. But that first twelve anna stamp printed by the Swiss firm of Helio Corvoisier, which had the right photogravure process in the Devanagari and Urdu Nastalik scripts, issued on 15 August 1948, is a beautiful one, especially in my view, because the clear depiction of his eyes smiling through the bifocals. A pair of his bifocal spectacles was presented to the National Gandhi Museum at Rajghat by my father Devdas. It is still housed there. Its plastic coated frame, which was broken, is yellowish. The lenses are intact, as is its black leather case. S. Benson and Company, Hornby Road, Bombay, is embossed on the case. Friends, we live in an age of commerce. In March 2009, some Gandhi memorabilia came to be sold at a New York auction for $2.8 million. One of the items to come under the Antiquorum auctioneer's hammer was a pair of spectacles purported to have been given by Gandhi to the Nawab of Junagadh. There is no direct evidence in terms of a letter from Gandhi or a real-time record of the gift. And so, while I have no sound or established reason to say the spectacles sold in that auction are not genuine, I cannot but notice that they lack the iconic round shape of the glasses he generally wore. The round-shaped glasses are very common. When I went the other years to get myself a pair of frames, and I saw one which looked like round. I said, Adi Henna Vele, O Adi Gandhi glass, sir. <laughs> Until then, he might reflect on the phenomenal signature value that is plain round shaped glasses with almost flexible temple arms have acquired over the decades. A Mumbai-based advertising firm has recently evolved something it calls the Gandhi font in the Devanagari script which takes off from the outline of Gandhi's spectacles. And of course, the outline of Gandhi's spectacles have now been patented by the Swachh Bharat movement and is to be seen in every manner of surface. Book cover illustrations and designs are known to have used the outline shape so easily replicable. You have heard me now, friends, long enough, and I must conclude. I shall do so with a thought on the shape of oculoplasty. Surgical or medical interventions to modify, restore, correct, enhance a shape have its own logic, its own merit. Those who have suffered disfigurement in accidents or episodes involving trauma need and deserve the correction that plastic surgery offers. To the recipients of such reconstructive or corrective surgery, the plastic surgeon would rightly appear to be akin to God the Creator. And for those who have been born with conditions like what is in common parlance called the cleft palate, such surgery is a great boon. One of the deepest satisfactions I have had in my life is to have spotted two small children in the Himalayan town of Kalimpong with the cleft palate condition and then having had them surgically treated in Kolkata. To have to endure strabismus or the squint, likewise, is no ordinary challenge. Dr. Surendran's name is inextricable from the correction of the squint. I am not sure if the term oculoplasty covers that branch of medicine. It perhaps does not. A surgical intervention to rectify that may be regarded as cosmetic in a sense. It is so, and yet it is much more than that. Gandhi encouraged persons to undergo surgery to rectify strabismus, as anyone would. In our country, with its warped attitudes, warped attitudes, on the status of the woman and the bride and the premium on what are supposed to be good looks with a bias 
for the lighter skin, for a woman to have that additional condition of strabismus is an unimaginably serious disability. But we ought to be aware of the possibility that plastic surgery can, in our times of growing affluence and even more wildly growing imitations of affluence, move from the house of medicine to the multiplex of the market. That is a most unfortunate trend. Ethics get called. A surgeon's knife, like a surgeon's time, is axiomatically booked for the needy, the urgent and the important. It should not be too easily borrowed, diverted by the cosmetically ambitious, the vainglorious and the narcissistic, and certainly not to the detriment of the deserving. Like that of Socrates, Gandhi's face would not win a place on the page of handsome faces in history. Many have remarked on the purported ugliness, in fact, of each of the parts of Gandhi's face. And his descendants can thank their maternal genes for having normalized the size and shape of Gandhi's ears in the family. Yet many have also acknowledged that the individual aspects of Gandhi's face taken together conjoined into a sublime visage. Francis Watson in his compilation quotes Louis Fisher as saying, Gandhi's face had a light in it. I will conclude with an anecdote relating to my esteemed brother Rajmohan Gandhi. Rajmohan soon became aware of the extreme asceticism of his grandfather's lifestyle. One day, he says, I bought a new pair of glasses when I went to see him before the prayer meeting. I knew that he might not approve of me spending a large sum of my parents' money on what would seem to him like some kind of consumer item. I was hoping that my busy grandfather, seeing so many people, would miss this little item on my nose. But he did not. And he said, Oh, Mohan, so I see you have something new on you today. I said, Of course, Bapu, you know my eyes are so bad, I really needed a new pair of glasses. Then he said, Of course, you needed a new pair of glasses. But did you need a new set of frames as well? To an extent, not an inconsiderable one. We have to think and thank the world of spectacles for enabling Gandhi to be the visionary that he was. Friends, by a set of curious circumstances, shortly before I came here, I was enabled to get access to the last prescription of Gandhi. He, have you got it? The last prescription. I do not know how to read. The ophthalmologists here will know how to read it. It just shows January 1947, a few months before his end, he got his eyes tested by Dr. Mitter, a Bengali ophthalmologist in Delhi. Those who have helped Gandhi see the world of nature, see the world of human beings more clearly than he otherwise would have, by tending his eyes, have done humanity a favour. I will now try to show if it has been possible to screen. The most recent statue of Gandhi made is it visible? Yes. Opened in Parliament Square in London. Parliament Square in London, right next to the statues of Churchill and Smuts, and near one of Abraham Lincoln and of Nelson Mandela, showing him wearing glasses. Gandhi saw British human nature, British political nature, Indian human nature, Indian political nature clearly through his glasses which helped him see those very subjects of his attention clearly through his penetrating eyes. 
I close my observations today with thanks to the memory of Dr. Badrinath and with thanks to all those who have donated to the efficiency and well-being of Sankarnetralaya for enabling all of us to share with each other today in Dr. Badrinath's memories the clear eyes and the clear lenses of a very ordinary man. I thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for taking us through the memories of Bapuji's spectacles. Few moments also made us feel as if we were sitting through the lectures of ophthalmology and optometry. And uh, we could see from the prescription that Bapuji was not short-sighted, he was far-sighted. I would like to inform and remind this August gathering about the events planned on Feb 24, 2024, the next Saturday. The management of the Medical Research Foundation and Vision Research Foundation cordially invites you all to the book release event Vegalil Oliyetrum Shankara Netralaya Varalatra Suvadagal written by Dr. T. S. Surendran Chairman and Sri Iran Goval and unveiling ceremony of a bust of Dr. S. S. Badrinath commemorating the birth anniversary of our beloved founder Padma Bhushan Dr. S. S. Badrinath Date to be remembered Feb 24th, the next Saturday, time 4 p.m., the same place is the venue. The bust of Dr. S. S. Badrinath will be unveiled by Sri Rajaji, one of the first patients of Dr. S. S. Badrinath. And the campus will be named after Padmabhushan Dr. S. S. Badrinath by Mr. Ramadurai of TCS. Thank you, sir. I now request Mr. Kannan Narayanan, Honorary Treasurer Medical Research Foundation, to render the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and SN colleagues. It's my pleasant duty to propose a word of thanks on this wonderful occasion when we are all made to recall our chief and founder who has left behind a great institution and a set of dedicated ophthalmologists and colleagues here. My first thanks goes to doc our chairman, Dr. Surendran, who conceived, collected support, and organized this wonderful event to commemorate our founder. Uh, I think it was his his inspiration to get it done and have this uh, wonderful occasion for us all of us to have a memorable occasion like this today. And wow, what an oration by Mr. Gandhi. It's a very great honor to listen. I have listened to him in the past as well. I'm looking forward to this wonderful lecture today. The old Sanskrit adage goes, Satyeshu Jayate Suraha, Sahasreshu Chapanditaha, Vakta Dasa Sahasreshu, Data Bhavati Vanava. That's what the Sanskrit world it says. Translating to modern numbers, they are saying one in a, maybe a million is having the eloquent speak based on his scholarship. And very rarely we find somebody who has a philanthropist and donor. Here a wonderful occasion where an eloquent speaker was paying tribute to Dr. Badinath, one in maybe a crow, a person who was found at this wonderful occasion. Thank you very much, sir, for a lovely occasion and sharing so wonderful anecdotes both humorously as well as also differing from Bapuji and sharing some of his wonderful views. Thank you very much. Very interesting. See, that's it. Thank you very much. And of course, today, um, I thank all our colleagues who have been present here, sparing a wonderful time and occasion in to honor our chief. Especially our time goes to the SN team, our housekeeping team, our event, event and media team, all of our staff, all of our colleagues, who have made this occasion wonderful and a grand success. And thank you, of course, for the audience for sparing your time and making this a great occasion for us. Many of us must be having a wonderful memories of our association, Dr. Badinath. Maybe as a teacher, maybe as a guide, maybe as a person who has corrected us, etc. And I'm sure those you will add today's memory as one of the cherished memories whenever we recall Dr. Badinath and association with you. Thank you very much. I think Dr. Uh, Surendran said this is going to be an annual event, an oration. I think we should use this an occasion to remember what Dr. Badinath stood for. His mission in life was to provide cutting-edge ophthalmic services 
to the affluent and the needy alike. That's what ESSEN stands for. I think thank you very much for making an annual occasion because that's when we will re-remember ourselves and re-dedicate ourselves to the cause of Dr. Badina. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for a wonderful occasion. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you.